I want to get your thoughts on the Congolese president, Felix uh, Sisha. Let, let me. She's a kitty. Shisekedi, thank you. Felix Shisekedi, he's been in his position since 2019. Um, he is head of government now at a time where uh, the people are becoming more emboldened to speak out against the UN and to speak out against uh, the Rwandan government um, and their support of the uh, the what we now call M23 rebels in the Congo. Uh, and, and I also saw that he was the chairperson uh, of the African Union up until recently, which is, which I didn't know, um, uh, which is interesting. So what do we know about him? Uh, so uh, the the Congolese president came through, he, he came to power in 2019 after the previous dictator uh, had overstayed in power. But the, again, thanks to the Congolese people and their resilience, they protested, they pushed him out. In spite of getting killed in the thousands, they continue to protest until that president left. So he staged an election. During that election, he realized that, you know, he had to leave. So he put on his own puppet uh, candidate. But his puppet candidate was so unpopular that he striked a deal with Chisekedi. And Chisekedi became the president against the popularly... Uh, Martin Fayulu, who would have been the president if they just went with the election results. Now, um, he has been president for that many years. Um, at the very beginning of this rebellion, I want to talk about this part, and then I'll, I'll go back to, to, to him as a president in general. Um, but a lot of the Congolese people, there are some Congolese people that support him. Uh, and for the most part, when you observe, it's very ethnic based. Uh, a lot of people are from his his ethnicity, what I've noticed in terms of who supports him. A lot of the people who actually were instrumental in pushing for change have been very outspoken uh, against his uh, presidency. Now, when this rebellion started, uh, and it's an invasion, sorry, I called it a rebellion. When Rwanda invaded the, the Congo in earlier this year, he didn't actually call out Rwanda. He went for months and months without calling out Rwanda. Uh, is, that, is that Felix or Fayulu? Felix. Okay. Felix. Felix. Fayulu has been very clear from the beginning. Um, you know, when it, when it comes to the the uh, invasion of the Congo and attacks on the Congo, he's he's very clear on uh, on his positions on Rwanda invading the Congo. But Felix was playing. I guess he was playing politics and diplomacy, and um, he he was he was silent about it. For many weeks and months, people went on talking, of calling him out for not actually being clear about this conflict. Eventually, he realized that he was becoming even more unpopular as a result. And there's an election next year in the Congo. There's supposed to be one. Hopefully, there will be one. Um, and he sees the opportunity to to boost his popularity. Now he's calling out uh, Rwanda. He's, he's actually been very clear in recent months. And I think it's a breath of fresh air that a Congolese leader is being very clear about the invasion of the Congo by Rwandan troops because the evidence is overwhelming. It's, it's very clear. Um, as a leader, I personally would not vote for him as, uh, as a leader, uh, considering the other candidates. Uh, but I do see uh, one of the things that I've noticed um, with him compared to his predecessors, his predecessors committed horrible atrocities. He has not done, he has not committed similar atrocities. So I'll give him credit for, for not doing that, uh, but definitely not the president that I would vote for. Very interesting. So there are elections coming up. So we'll wrap with this question. Um, what should people keep in mind as they're learning about uh, Rwanda, learning about the Congo? What should they look for if they're coming across mainstream media outlets? I mean, one option is just don't read them, right? So that you don't get confused. But if you do come across the headlines, I mean, that's I do it just to know where they're going. But yeah. when it comes to other countries, I mean, including the Congo and Rwanda, I read it and then I put a pin in it and then I come to you and I come to Kabali and a bunch of other people and say, what does this mean? Um, but I think for a lot of people, it's almost better not to read it if you don't have yeah. the time 
to scrutinize it or have the, the, the people and the resources to um, bounce it off of. Although I guess this is what conversations like this are about. But in general, what are some patterns that people should look for when reading about the Congo or Rwanda and to look out for um, as far as the disinformation goes? Uh, I, I think it's important to, <clears throat> if anybody goes and reads the uh, mainstream media and follows mainstream media, first of all, uh, think about the way the way history is told, even our own history. You know, who has the power? Ask the question, who has the power? What voices are left out? And why might those voices be left out? Um, and also think about the whitewashing. If you, if you think about it, think of it in, in this way. When you look at the Congo, if the Congo was a European country, or it was America, or it was Canada, or it was, you know, it was France, the UK, or one of the European countries, and the same thing was happening there, would the reporting be the same way that this reporting is done? And the question is going to be no. Secondly, ask yourself the question, especially when you see people justifying things that are just unacceptable. Would anybody that writes these newspapers or that's presenting this news agree to have their children live under the conditions that the Congolese people are subjected to. Lastly, connect the dots. Look at what's happening in the Congo and the Great Lakes region of Africa. Look at what's happening in the Sahel, in Mali, in uh, in Mali and uh, Burkina Faso and um, in in Niger, look at the Horn of Africa, especially in Ethiopia. Look at Saint, uh, North Central Africa in Chad. When you connect those dots and you look at the support of dictators, where dictators are praised, and they are abusing not only the people in their own countries but in neighboring countries. You look at the policies in Libya, if you connect all of those dots, you will see the disinformation. You will see a pattern because a person, it's easy for a person from Rwanda or, or Congo to now see the disinformation on Ethiopia because we have lived it, because we have seen it. A person from Uganda can see that because they have seen it, they have lived it. A person from Burkina Faso or Mali can actually recognize it because they have lived it, they have seen it. So connect the dots. Do not think of these countries as islands onto themselves. We are part of a connected continent that was divided up and cut up into pieces at the Berlin Conference for the purpose of us staying only focused on the little pieces of land that we are from. But when we actually think and look at the continent in general, then we'll get to see the full picture. So th those are the things that I would say, take a look at in order to deconstruct the disinformation. Yeah, I think that's a really good, uh, I want to put up your Twitter link because some people are asking, let me know if I got that wrong. It's at Shinani. There's an, there's an I in there. Oh, is it S -H at Shinani one? Okay, let's. Uh, There's an I there. Okay, yeah. got it. I'll fix that. Um, yeah, I think that's a really good uh, shorthand. Look at that story and it's Shinani one. Yes, yes. Okay, thank you. Yeah, just look at the story and then put yourself in that position, which is something that a lot of, I'm sorry, my Americans, I love you. You know, like I grew up here. <laughs> Most of my friends that I grew up with are Americans, but, and I get it. They don't have the time. It's very difficult. They're, you know, they're trying to stay informed. You know, some of their parents wake up and read the New York Times every morning. They thought they knew about the world. So in so many ways, I don't um, blame them, but, and that that's, that's why I think it's really good to just go down to the basics instead of trying to, you know, teach everyone who the players are everywhere all at once, which is completely overwhelming. Nobody has a time or interest unless they are connected to these countries. And I totally understand that life in America is not easy either. You know, everyone's very busy trying to survive. Uh, but I think that is a really good shorthand. Put yourself in that position and say, would I want to live in that kind of country? Would I want to live under those conditions? Would I want to send my kids to school or not send my cool kids to school under those conditions? And if the answer yeah. is no, we have to ask why that's happening. It's yeah. worth asking why instead of just assuming that's how they are and that's how that country yeah. is. And why does America think it's okay? Why do 
uh, the, does the Western world think that it's okay for that to happen? 